Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to PFC's webinar on understanding and analyzing financials for charities. My name is Lisa Goulet. I'm Director of Member Relations and Research at PFC. Thank you for joining us today. So while everybody is uh, uh, connecting, we'll uh, just uh, start with the land acknowledgement before uh, we get started officially. But I want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Tim Ellis, who's here with me today, and Merve, who are uh, both working with uh, PFC. So we're lucky to have them with us today as well. And of course, uh, Mike Bernucci from Mongea Bernucci, Chartered Accountant, so who's our speaker today. And I think we'll give a minute or two to let people join. I see people are connecting now. So maybe Tim, I'll let you start with the uh, land acknowledgement. Yeah, so just to begin, uh, we would like to recognize the many territories of Turtle Island on which we work and reside. So these territories are home to many indigenous peoples who have lived here for tens of thousands of years and who continue to live here. Uh, PFC itself in Chochage or Montreal is located on the unceded land of the Ganyangahaga. Uh, and has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg. As settlers, immigrants, and their descendants, and as visitors, we honor and respect the many Indigenous peoples of this land and hope for a more just future together. So thank you so much. Uh, and I guess I'll pass it off to, to Mike from here. Good afternoon. So the purpose of this webinar is to give you some tools so that you feel comfortable in your decision making to fund a charitable organization. I don't expect this webinar to answer all your questions, but I do hope it will help. It will help. Your judgment or your gut feel will play an important role. So if at the end of your analysis, you do not feel comfortable, it's what we call a red flag. And you're gonna be hearing a lot about red flags today. Just move on. Uh, gut feelings are usually very important after you've done your analysis. And if you're not comfortable, you just move on. So on the agenda today, so if you can go to the agenda. Today, we're going to discuss what is the difference between a charity and an NPO. We'll be very brief on that because we're really looking at charities. Um, we're going to look at how to determine financial sustainability of the receiving charity. There's gonna be various methods. We're gonna look for the auditor's opinion, um, the financial statements. Uh, we're gonna look for red flags on these. We're going to have a brief discussion on taxes, and that's because this issue has come up um, on a few occasions from PFC. So uh, we will just, this, there's a, a good document attached to this, uh, some good slides that are attached, which was prepared by a tax lawyer from Spiegel Solman, Somer. Uh, he couldn't be here to present it today, but I will do a brief overview on it. And if you have any questions, you, you will have us his coordinates so that you can contact him. And then there's gonna be a question period. I'm hoping to have as many answers as possible for you, but if not, then I'll refer you to Louis Fred or to your own accountants for certain answers. Next slide. So all charities are NPOs, are not-for-profit organizations, but not all NPOs are charities. Today, our interest is going to be only in charities. Charities are incorporated and they submit bylaws and their mission statement to the government when they incorporate. Much harder process to get accepted these days by CRA as a charity. Charities are governed by a board of director. So the Canada Revenue Agency does not require a char registered charity to have an annual audit but the charity may be required to do so under provincial law or under their bylaws or by request of their funders. This audit could be done by a professional accountant, the CPA, or what they can do is they can ask for the treasurer to make a statement on the financial statements, which I think the treasurer of the organization, which I think this has got a bit less uh, of importance than if an audit is done. Charities Canada, as, as, even though it does not require an audit, it has made a statement that it highly recommends that if your income is greater than $250,000, that you should get an audit. Next slide. So these next two slides, I printed them out off uh, the CRA website, and it will give you the differences between a registered charity 
and an NPO. So if you look at topic, if you look at the, slow, at the, the three headings, there's topic, registered charity, and NPO. So the purpose, you must be established and operate exclusively for charitable purposes to be a registered charity. An NPO can operate for social wealth, welfare, civic improvement, pleasure, sport, recreation, or any other purpose ex except profit. You cannot operate exclusively for charitable purposes. That's an NPO. Registration. You must apply to be a registered charity. You must apply and be approved for registration as a charity. And any of you, any of your organizations that have gone through this process, you will realize that it's quite a lengthy process and quite complicated. An NPO does not have to go through a registration process for income tax purposes. Charitable registration number. Registered charity is issued a charitable registration number once it's approved by CRA. And there are strict guidelines to follow afterwards. NPO is not issued a number. Tax receipts. You can issue official, you can issue official donation receipts for income tax purposes as a charity. One point I want to draw to your attention. This is ex extremely important that you keep track of your tax receipts. Tax receipts are considered cash in the eyes of the CRA, of the Charities Division, and therefore you have to make sure that when you issue a, a, a donation receipt, uh, that you have received the funds. And if you've received the funds, in, if you receive a gift in kind, that it has been evaluated, that the numbers on your, donation, on your donation receipts follow, that you do not throw away a receipt that is canceled, that you keep it and you mark canceled on it. An NPO does not, cannot issue a donation receipt, an official donation receipt. Spending requirements, there's a disbursement quota, uh, which charities must follow. NPOs, no. Next slide. Designation. Charity is designated by CRA as a charitable organization, a public foundation, or a private foundation. An NPO does not receive the status. Returns, these are tax returns. So a, char a registered charity must file an annual return, which is a T3010, within six months of its financial year end. So again, you do not file a normal corporate tax return for a charity, the T3010 is the equivalent of that and it gives all the information necessary to the government. You do not pay any income tax on your revenues, on your net income, but you must file this return. A, an NPO must file a T2 return. Now an NPO does not usually pay any income tax, but if you have money that has been given to you by your members, so we'll look at a, um, at a condo and it's an NPO, a condo association. If it has money in its account and this money is sitting in a, an investment account, you will have to pay tax on whatever return you have made on this investment, not the money that has been put in by the members. A charity, personal benefits the members, cannot use its income to personally benefit any of its members. An NPO, the same thing, cannot use its income to personally benefit its members. Tax exempt status, for corporate income taxes, a charity is exempt from paying income tax. The NPO is, like I explained before, just on its property income. Now GST and HST, that is quite complicated. Um, any questions in this area, I'll try to answer if there are any later on but these are really questions that uh, louis Frederic Cote would be able to answer. He's a GST QST specialist. And there are so many intricacies in this. Generally, you do not pay, uh, you do not charge income tax um, for your supplies, for your revenues. And when you have purchases, you pay your GST and your HST and your QST, but you do get a refund. You'll see later on, the percentages that you get back. On the other side, the same thing with um, NPOs. NPOs will have to charge on certain supplies. 
Next slide. Now we're going to, going to start looking at financial sustainability of charities. And it's difficult to assess at times. So how does a charity fund its programs and its services? It may be easy to determine short term, but much harder on the long term. Next slide. So what are some of the indicators? So one of the things you'd be looking at is the support. Where does the support come from? Does it come from a big group? Uh, when it's a small group, it can be a problem because if one somebody backs out, um, then it becomes very difficult to sustain the organization. Um, if we're looking at these days co with COVID, there's a lot of foundations that suffered huge losses in the month of March um, this year when, when everything was closed down and the investments dropped significantly. So a lot of our organizations were not giving out money because they could not cash in on some of their investments. They didn't want to lose that, that much money. So therefore they were waiting before giving money to charities. So when you have many funders, it makes things a little, a little bit easier. Also what that showed us this year with COVID is that charities need a cash cushion to weather the storm. Now, the big question is, what is a reasonable reserve? And we've discussed this at length, you know, is it three months, six months, 12 months? And when does a, a funder sit back and say, there's too much money in the charity, so why would we give them more money? So what we're looking at is, you know, even at three months, three months we might say is not sufficient of a cash reserve, but there are a lot of deserving charities out there that don't have more than three months. So it would be very interesting if, it would be prudent not to just say, we're not gonna fund this organization because it only has a three month reserve. The last indicator is a very strong reporting system. Why? because funders need to know before giving any money. The funders board has fiduciary duty vis-a-vis -vis its foundations to ensure that funds prior to be giving to charities, that it has done a proper analysis and that, that the charity meets the foundation's mission statement, because that's very important also. Next slide. So what does the funder do? Where does it search? So these are a couple of the areas where the funder can start looking. They can look at the organization's website. They could look at, they could do a computer search, budget versus actual and the financial, financial statements. Next page. So organization's website. The website could be a pool of information. You can look at the programs that they are running. You look at, you, they, they usually tell you who their funders are. It gives you financial information about the organization, gives you news. It gives you who the board of directors are, which is also going to be very important as we move on. Next slide. Computer search. So there's various search engines. There's Google, Microsoft Outlook, Edge, I don't know about you, but as soon as somebody asks me for money, the first thing I do is I, after I look at their website, I do a search as to see if there's any bad press on the organization, number one. Number two, I look at some of the names of the board of directors and I go look them up to see where they're from. One of the things I do look at is who sits on the board. There should be at least one CPA or accountant, and at least one lawyer. And that's because you wanna make sure that they get some information, some free information as to how they're running their, their organization. You ask for budget versus actual. Next slide. So this is one of the most important documents, even more important than looking at, than when we look at the financial statements because the budget versus actual will give you how the resources will be allocated on the budget, what measures will be used to evaluate the progress, and more effectively, 
when linked to overall the charity strategies. Next page. So when you review the budget versus actual, you're gonna look for the following. The revenues, were the goals attained? So you're gonna compare your budget and your actual figures. And if not, why, and if not, why were they not met? And there should be explanations as to the variances. There should be a variance column also. And the variances should be explained. On the expenses, the same thing. You wanna look at the major variances and you wanna look at the reasons that were given. Then you look at the bottom line and you're gonna look at the bottom line for two reasons. You wanna see number one, was there an excess? Were they budgeting an excess over revenue, over expenses? Were they budgeting a break even? Were they budgeting a small cushion? And at the same time, you wanna look at the bottom line because you're going to match the bottom line of your actual figures to your financial statements to make sure that your bottom line matches on your financial statements. Next slide. So foundations that donate to charities, they must always ask for the following. The audited financial statements, the budget versus actual, and the budget for the following year. Next slide. So financial statement review. One thing we're gonna look at is, does the charity need funds? So you will look at the net assets versus the annual costs of projects. And there you're gonna determine, is there a cushion? There should be at least six to nine months reserve. But again, as I said, stated before, if there is not six months, there's only a three month reserve. Also look at what does the charity do? Is it a needing charity? Does it do good programs? And you might be able, you may want to help them get an extra reserve for the future. And one of the more important points is where, when do you say, when does a foundation or a giving organization say there's too much cushion? My personal, Judgment is I look at if it has two years or more of a cushion, that means two times the actual expenses it's budgeting for the, the, the following year. Then at that point, for me, it's a red flag. When I say it's a red flag, it's just something I will not look at and, and give money to or, or advise my, cli my clients to give money to. I'll say we can wait, they can wait a year and next year we'll reevaluate if they've used up some of their cushion. You also don't want to give to a charity that already has a very huge cushion and doesn't really need your money. You may want to give it to some other organization that needs you. Next slide. So now we're looking at the financial statements. Usually your first three pages of your financial statements are your auditor's report. So you're going to read the auditor's report. You don't need to read all of it. You can browse over pages two and three of the auditor's report. What you're going to want to look at in detail is the audit opinion, which is usually paragraph two of the auditor's opinion. And in there, it will give you if there's any qualifications and the basis for the qualified opinion. And if there's a going concern issue. Now, Certain people will say, well, if there's a qualification or a basis of a, for a qualified opinion, it's a red flag and you stop. Before you do that, there's a standard qualification that most auditors will put on charities. And this qualification has to do with the revenues that are derived from contributions and donations for the completeness of which is not susceptible to satisfactory audit verification. I do not consider this to be a red flag because you will see this in 90%, if not 95% of your charities that will give you their financial statements. So what you really are gonna be looking for is other types of qualified opinions, a going concern issue. That, that, that means that the organization will not be able to continue in the future. And you'll see that when we're looking at the actual statement of financial position, which is also what we call the balance sheet. 
one of the other things I would suggest you look at right away is the before you even continue is your mission statement, the mission statement of the charity. And the mission statement of the charity is usually note one of the notes of the financial statements. And the reason you'll look at that is you want to make sure that the mission statement meets that you will, your foundation or your giving organization, or your charity, that your mission statement meets the quality, that their the mission statement of the receiving charity meets your qualifications. Because if it doesn't, you may not want to give to this organization. And that's another red flag. And you just say, you do not meet our mission. Next page. So now we start looking after you read the financial, the auditor's report, you turn to the statement of financial position, which is the balance sheet. You look at your net assets. The net assets are usually at the bottom of the page. Uh, there's going to be the assets, there's going to be the liabilities, and after the liabilities, it's the net assets. If the net assets, you look to see if they're positive or negative. If it's negative, that's a major red flag. I would stop and move on. In my book, it would not be an area, an organization that I would want to fund because it does not have sufficient money to continue operating. It's virtually either a going concern issue, depending on the size of the, uh, how negative the, um, the net assets are. So you may not want to fund this type of organization unless you feel that you can fund it enough to bring it out of a, net, of a negative situation. If the net assets are positive, then you're gonna look at the ratios of the balance sheet. So one ratio which I find to be extremely, extremely important is your liquidity ratio, which is your current assets versus your current liabilities. Your current assets should be greater than one to one. That means if you take all your current assets, an example, they're $400,000, usually current assets would be cash, receivables, inventory, and your current liabilities are $350,000, you know that there are sufficient current assets to be able to pay off the current liabilities. The current liability and the current asset are items that are less than 12 months old that have to be received or paid within 12 months in the future. So if your current, if your liquidity ratio, your current assets versus your current liabilities is less than one to one, that means you have more current liabilities than current assets. Again, it in my book might be a, a major red flag. The next thing you wanna look at is your debt to equity ratio. You look at the debt and what it's for for assets or for working capital. Now, in a charity, I'll go, I just wanna go off on this for a few seconds. In a charity, usually a charity does not have too much debt. The only debt it may have is if it owns real estate, it may have a mortgage on it. But again, it may not have a big mortgage. And the reason for this is that, remember that the members do not benefit from uh, any, surplus or any net assets like we do in private organizations. Therefore, a bank wants to make sure that if there's real estate, that there is sufficient equity in the real estate that if they have to exercise their, their debt requirements, they will be able to sell the real estate and collect on it. So it's not a big, big area where it could create a big, big problem. The other thing you want to look at is your accounts receivable and your accounts payable. Uh, make sure that in your accounts receivable, there are no, not that many bad debts. And the same thing with your accounts payable. So you may want to look at the list of accounts receivable and the list of accounts payable and look and see on your receivables. Are there a lot of receivables that are older than 90 days? That could be a red flag. And on your accounts payable, are there a lot of payables that are greater than 90 days? That means you may not have sufficient amount of money to pay them off, which is another red flag. Uh, Mike, could I maybe uh, give you a, give you a little bit of a breather, and maybe we can go through a few uh, questions on, on the material you've presented so far. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, one of the questions uh, uh, is, uh, relates to something you said early on in your presentation regarding um, charities with revenue over 200,000. The question is, um, should charities with revenue over 200,000 consider having their organization audited? And does this recommendation apply to both public and private foundations? The, this is not, this is a recommendation, it's 250,000. And this is a recommendation from um, the government. Now, again, if you're a foundation and you do not receive funds and your um, bylaws do not say that you need an audit, you may not want to have an audit done. If you're a receiving organization, if you're a charity, a charity that receives funds, therefore it's getting money from a foundation. So a foundation may require you to have an audit done or may say, we don't give money to organizations that do not have, have audits done. So there, when we're looking at it, it depends where you're sitting. So if you're sitting, there no, it's not a requirement by the government, but if you're, a receive, if you're a charity that receives funds from foundations and other charities, they may not want to give you money if there's not an audit done because they don't have certainty that the financial statements that they're looking at are prepared in a proper manner. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point and it's a good segue into the next question as well, Mike, which asks for an explanation on why a foundation donating to another charity should review audited financial statements as opposed to unaudited. Well, they, it will depend on the giving foundation and they may say we, and depending on the receiving charity, the receiving charity may be less than 200 revenues of 250 or may not have sufficient funds. And it's a very interesting organization that does interesting programs, but may not have the resources to pay an audit. An audit is a very expensive um, proposition. So an audit can cost anywhere between 10,000 to depending on the size. So a smaller organization, smaller charity that receives funds may not have the money available, but maybe doing some programs which are very interesting. So we've seen some, some charities that do um, programs for children, have, have camps for children, and they do not have audited statements and their revenues are not over 250, or even if they are over 250, they do a lot of programs. And there's foundations that are interested in still giving them money. So that again, we're going to go back to, we go back to one of the first comments I made, which is your gut feeling. Once you meet the receiving organization or you look at their, you look at all their information, if you feel comfortable with the organization, you may still want to give to them, even though you're not having an audit done. Good. Uh, one more question, uh, then I'll let you continue on with your presentation, Mike. We have about uh, you know 15 minutes left, so we'll have to zoom through the final slides. But yeah, uh, the question, question is, the final the ones are, are, tax, are tax slides, so they'll go very fast. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, so the last one we'll address for now, and then we'll try to get to all of the questions a little bit later. Does the cushion include endowment funds? And I think the person here is talking about the reserve fund. Yeah. So an endowment fund, it, it's very difficult to to say yes or to say yes or no on that. But an endowment fund, when it's a big endowment fund, uh, usually the endowments are invested; they generate revenues. So you will want to look and see how much money is being generated by the endowment fund in your revenue and your expenses. So again, the the giving organization also has endowment funds. And therefore they may turn around and say, well, listen, we don't want to give to another charity that has a huge endowment fund. Good, excellent. Well, we have some more good questions, but I'll hold those off till a little bit later and let you uh, continue on with your presentation then, Mike, okay. thanks. So tell me if we can go to the next slide. So the next statement we're looking at is the statement of operations. So. Statement of operations, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the bottom of the page and we're going to match the excess or deficit of revenue over expenses to your budget versus actual that you looked at before to make sure that the actuals, that the net 
corresponds. And the reason I'm just saying look at the net is that usually on your budget versus actual, there's much more detail than there is on a financial statement, an audited financial statement for various reasons. So therefore, you just wanna make sure that the bottom line matches. Uh, your budget versus actual could be set up where salaries are shown separately or programs are shown separately and versus uh, on your financial statements, salaries are broken down differently. So you wanna look at the bottom line to make sure it matches. So again, when you look at the bottom, if there is an excess of deficiency over revenues, if there's a deficiency of revenue over expenses, that's a red flag. And you're gonna to have to evaluate as to whether and ask questions as to why there was a deficiency. And again, go back to your budget versus actual to make sure. You're gonna look at the breakdown of the expenses. So if you turn the page, uh, next, uh, next page, you're always gonna ask questions about the following. Professional fees, you wanna see how much of the professional fees are legal expenses. And usually if they're, when you're looking at your professional fees and you're comparing to the previous year, if there's a big change, you're gonna ask why. And you're gonna ask if your legal expenses are higher, you're gonna ask, are there any lawsuits? Because that's a red flag. You wanna know what the lawsuits are for and you want to make sure that you're not giving to an organization to cover lawsuits that, that they have. The next line item that I like to look at is entertainment expenses. You want to make sure they're reasonable. Um, I'll give you an example. One of our foundations was going to give to an organization, to a charity, and there was a substantial amount of money. And they went to meet the executive director we're talking about 25 years ago. And the executive director uh, took him out for lunch and took him to a fancy Italian restaurant, not far from where the organization was located. And the had his own private table. On the table, there was actually his name on it. And he ordered some an expensive bottle of wine. So the giving organization came back and first thing they said to me is, we don't want to fund fancy meals where the executive director is out every day having fancy meals and we're giving them money. So one of the things you want to look at is the entertainment expenses and ask what they were, what they consisted of. Um, and meals, meals, usually it's called meals and entertainment because the meals could also be that they're having the meetings and whatnot. So, and, it, and it's in there. So therefore that that's very reasonable. If they, especially if they have quite a few, uh, there are quite a few meetings and quite a few uh, groups, meetings. The next thing you wanna look at is admin uh, salaries. Your administrative salaries, again, we're looking at charities now. You're giving money to a charity. So you wanna make sure that your admin salaries are reasonable in comparison to the total program costs. Because if your admin salaries are astronomical and through the roof, do you want to fund admin salaries? And you know, different organizations will have a benchmark and they'll say, we don't want to give if admin salaries are greater than 30%. Because these are fixed salaries that are going to always be there. You'll also want to ask what benefits are being paid for employees, cell phones, parking, travel, and what type of expenses are being paid. You're then going to want to look at your program re revenues versus your program expenses. You want to look at the number of programs there are, what the major program expenses are. Are they salaries? Are they rentals? That's quite important to look at. Again, all of this is going to be something that once you've gone through this analysis, you will walk away feeling comfortable or not comfortable. So this is going to be one of the statements that's going to be extremely important for you to look at with the budget versus actual, because this is going to really give you at the end of the day, if you feel comfortable with what is being done by the organization, and if they are meeting their mission statement, and if they are doing programs that are important for you, and if it's something that you want to get involved in. Once you've looked at the statement of operations, next page, you're going to look at your notes to the financial statements. 
Now, you're also the financial statement. Again, the mission statement is extremely important. You want to look at it. You want to look at your long-term debt note. You want to see if there's any defaults on it to see if they're up to date with their payments, if, it's a, if there's a mortgage. You want to look and see what their current portion of the their current portion of long-term debt is, and you want to see what their per portion, how many more years they have to pay this debt. You're going to want to look at the contingency note. Contingency note will tell you how many years left they have on their leases. Usually their rental of the location where they're in is going to be in there, but there's also other leases that are in there, photocopy machines, uh, any assets that they're leasing, computers and so forth. So you want to see what their no, what their what their leases payments are going to be for the next few years, what they've signed on for. Usually, if there's a lawsuit and there's some evaluation that could be done, there's going to be a note on lawsuits. So you want to look to see are there any notes on lawsuits, and it'll explain to you what they are. So you want to you want to make sure that you can ask questions on all of these things. Next page. When you look at all of this, remember, honesty is the best policy. So you want to make sure that you're getting an honest answer from the charity that you're giving money to. You don't want to get a runaround. We've seen this often, and we tell all our charities, give the honest truth to your funders. If they don't like it, they'll move on, but at least you've been honest with them. You've told them exactly what's going on, and they're not going to put a next year next organization. Next year is another year. So always be honest about everything you be, be, be honest. So if you feel that they have not been honest with you, that's a major red flag. I wouldn't deal with this organization unless there's a change in administration or a change in board in the future years. That's extremely important. Next page. Next page, we're going to look a bit at red flags. Uh, I had given a seminar uh, uh, several years ago, and I had prepared a little something for red flags. So if you look at the source documents, it'll give you, it's a control sheet, and it'll give you the source document, what's a red flag, and then notes next to it. So just because it's a red flag does not mean that you're not going to do business with the organization but at least it's a red flag for you. You'll put yes, and then you'll write yourself some notes. So the first one is when you look at the auditor's report, going concern reference, very important. That's usually in the opinion. And that's a red flag. Yes, if there is one. And then you're going to put your notes there. Qualified opinion. Again, if the qualified opinion only has to do with the, with, with the qualified with donations received, then to me, that's not a red flag. I would put no and I would move on. If it's got to do with something else, yes. Then you would put your notes, you would ask your questions from the organization to make sure you feel comfortable. If at any point, so in the auditor's report, you do not feel comfortable anymore, you don't have to continue. You don't have to go to the statement of financial position because you're not going to lend to the organization. You're not going to give to the organization. So you just move on. You stop there and you just move on. If you feel comfortable with the auditor's reports, with the answers you've received, then you move to your statement of financial position. Does your balance sheet or your statement of financial position balance? The assets balance to the total assets, balance to the total liabilities and to the net assets. The answer is no. That means the statement you're receiving has not been prepared by somebody who knows what they're doing. So therefore, that to me is a major red flag. Your accounts receivable, are they very high? Or are you know, they recording receivables that should not be received? So you wanna look at that and ask questions. Same thing with inventory. Usually inventory in these type of organizations and charities, they don't have much inventory. So if you see that this charity has a lot of inventory of goods that they wanna sell, t-shirts or whatnot, you may wanna see, are they redundant assets? and assets that will not be able to be sold in the future. And has there been a good evaluation done? Current assets versus current liability ratios, we discussed that before. 
are the liabilities too high based on the operations? Again, you want to see how much you do you owe on your basis versus your operations? If the answer is yes, you need to get some answers. Your total assets. So your total assets less your capital assets are not sufficient to cover your current liabilities. And several months of future operations, your cushion. That's again, major red flag. Now, each organization will have to be, each give funding organization, each giver should determine what they feel they are comfortable in giving with. So what is their, the cushion that they feel comfortable with? Three months, six months, 12 months, that's up to you. Net assets are they negative? Again, to me, that's a major red flag. Statement of operations. You're dependent on, is the organization dependent on one source of revenue? Red flag in my book. The type of revenues, are they detailed? That's quite important to us. We wanna know what type of investment income they're receiving, what type of program revenue they're receiving, donation revenue they're receiving. So you wanna see what, you want some detail on the financial statement. If it's not on the financial statement, it should be on your budget versus action. The expense categories, you wanna look at them to see if they're appropriate or not. Again, professional fees, entertainment expenses, and so forth. The deficiency for the year. If there's a deficiency, how big was it? What is it a one-time the the deal? Has it been happening for several years? You may wanna look at previous years, a couple of previous years to see, are they always losing money? Budget versus actual. You wanna look at the major variances from your budget. Remember your budget is prepared at the beginning of the year and they have certain basis for preparing it. So you wanna know if they haven't been budgeting correctly, why aren't they budgeting correctly? And you may wanna ask for previous years to see, are they always, are they preparing a balanced budget? Are they preparing a budget, a conservative budget? Or are they preparing budgets that are really not realistic? So these are certain essentials that donors must look at. It's not all of them, but it's some of them. Next page. So we discussed this pre previously. Is it a red flag or not? Yes. Do they have sufficient reserves? Yes. Again, where do you feel comfortable? Is it six months, 12 months, two years? In my, my book or myself, it would be two years. Anything less than that, I would definitely look at. Next page. So what are the tax rules for charities and MPOs in terms of GST, HST, and TDQ? So that we're going to look at a document, next page, a document that was prepared by Maitre louis Federic Coté. I am not a tax lawyer. I'm not a tax specialist. Um, I have some knowledge of GST, HST, and QST. I get a lot of my answers from Louis Fred. So if there's certain questions that I will not be able to answer, please uh, move on to your, uh, contact Louis Fred or ask your, your outer auditors. They'll be able to speak to their tax lawyers and get you some answers. Next page. So, Charity for GST, HST, and QST purposes is generally defined as a registered charity or registered Canadian amateur athletic association as determined under the Income Tax Act, but does not include a public institution, which is defined as a school, a public college, a university, a hospital, or a municipality. So now, one of the things I just want to clarify, because, because of COVID this year, they, the government originally had a private school, they had determined that a private school was considered a public institution. We got them to change that. A private school, many private schools are charities and therefore are not public institutions. What we consider a public institution are CGEPs, uh, public colleges, universities, hospitals, municipalities, uh, schools in the public sector. Next page. We discussed this before. So supplies by charities are generally exempt. So a supply to me is a revenue. Therefore, charity will not charge GST, HST 
to be collected on certain, and these are certain examples, renting parking spaces in a hospital, except when an election is made, generally the admission in respect of a place of amusement run by volunteers, which are not used for public, for, for gambling purposes, supply of food, beverages, or short-term accommodation if it is made in the course of an activity, the purpose of which is to relieve poverty, suffering, or distress, and not fundraising. Generally, the supply of tangible property or service if sold for its direct cost. So next page. And he just goes on to explain to you other, other areas which are not considered uh, revenues that you have to charge GST. QST, if you're giving food and beverages to seniors, underprivileged and individuals with disabilities under a program operated for the purpose. Again, you do not charge GST, QST in the residence. Personal property or service in the course of fundraising, again, uh, sometimes you'll go to a silent auction and the, at a silent auction, which is a fundraiser, the person who gives the gift will get the tax receipt. If you are buying, if you are bidding on the uh, item, you will not receive a tax receipt and there's no GST or QST charge on that. And the rules on those type of things, there's an evaluation done. If the item is um, if the auction item is given for much higher than the value, the fair market value, the donee of the, the, the amount will receive a receipt up to the fair market value. The purchaser will get a donation receipt for the difference between the fair market value and the amount that was actually paid for. Next page, we can, these are public sectors. So I don't think I, these are there for you to look at, but really not something that we're going to look at because we really were looking at charities today. So therefore, um, if you can, we can just skip right to the page with rebates. So these are the rebates. So when a charity, I just want you to look at the last line. When a charity purchases items, it pays GST and QST, an example. If a charity is going to buy a computer for its organization, when it goes to the store, it will pay GST and QST if it's in Quebec or GST, HST if it's in Ontario or somewhere else, it will pay the full amount. It will then prepare a report and get back 50% of the GST and the QST that it has paid. You can pay, you can usually file quarterly or um, semi-annually or yearly, and you will get this money back from the government, if you're a registered charity. Next page, small suppliers. So if there's anything that is considered a taxable supply and your supplies are less than $50,000 in a year, then there's no GST, HST or QST to be collected. Again, I would suggest that you speak to your tax specialists on this, but in a nutshell, you should not be charging GST, QST in most areas of what you're doing because they're not taxable supplies. That ends my presentation. So we can go through some questions and answers. Great, excellent. Thank you, uh, Mike. I'll let you uh, have a sip of water there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. We have lots of interesting questions related to your presentation, but I think I'll start with this one because we haven't really addressed the issue of COVID-19 and the impact on charities specifically. So this question asks, how would you approach risk in the context of COVID-19, knowing that many excellent, well-governed charitable organizations have simply lost revenue and are less stable? Again, the this is where the charities now need help. So a funder should look at the charity and if it meets its mission statement and it's something that they feel strong about, then they should help the charity to make sure that it gets over the hump. And some charities do have a cushion, but as things are, as time is moving on, we're seeing that we're not out of COVID yet. 
So therefore, charities these days do need help. Investments, thank God, have done a lot better since the March, even though now we see that they're going down a bit, and that's because there's a U.S. election coming up. But I, from what we're understanding is that the investments are very stable, and therefore funding organizations that have uh, some good monies, uh, some, good fun, uh, some good reserves, should be able to help out some charities. So therefore, you should be looking at that, at helping them out. All right, thank you. Um, another question, a bit more uh, uh, specific in terms of the, pre the slide that you were referring to uh, relating to ratio analysis. Yes. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's actually a, a good question as well, because the comment is it's, it's ratio analysis is of, often also useful for comparing with the average of the industry. And the question is, is there a source of data or information that has the average for the charitable industry in Canada? Not that I know of. Uh, you can go maybe on the Charities Canada website, uh, but I, I don't really think that there's not that I know of, that whether there's an industry average that they look at. And again, there are a lot of charities out there that are doing great job and are doing something very important and do not have excellent ratios. It should not be something that we just walk away from because we may want a bigger organizations or a group of smaller organizations to get together and help them. And another question relating to uh, salaries, as you also mentioned a little bit earlier when there are red flags in that particular situation. The comment is, it seemed you suggested that admin salaries should be kept low, but if these salaries are not livable wages, is the long-term success of the charity not at risk because low salaries may prompt high turnover or burnout? I, I did not say that the salary should be kept low. What I said is that we should be looking at admin salaries and see what, what they, they'll usually not give you the detail of what the salaries are. But if you look at your admin salaries and if an organization has programs of $400,000 and has admin salaries of $275,000 or $300,000, and then you have program costs, you may want to look at, look at that a bit more in detail. So I'm not saying that the people that are working in organization, not-for-profit organizations and charities should make a low salary. No, they should be compensated fairly and equally to what their counterparts are making in industry. But executive directors of, of charities usually do not make as much as an executive director of some other organizations. Unfortunately. Very true. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, now a question again, a little bit of a technical question in terms of endowment holdings. Is it appropriate to ask charities for their policies on when they might spend down endowment holdings to determine financial need? What if they have very large holdings and no plan to access capital ever? That happens. An endowment fund usually is money that you is restricted and therefore one of the things you'd want to look at is, are they internally restricted or externally restricted? Another thing that's quite important is, even though an, an, an endowment is externally restricted, you can always go back to the donor and ask the donor if you can unrestrict the amount, if they would unrestrict the amount. This is for the chair on the charity side. Um, so again, that's going to depend on the giving organization. And once the giving organization sits down and discusses the financial statements, they may tell you that their endowment cannot be touched. And usually on the fund, on the financial statements, if, if the amount is restricted in the net assets, it will say restricted assets. Unrestricted, uh, it'll say internally restricted or externally restricted. So externally restricted means that the donor has told them that they cannot touch the funds or they can touch the funds for different reasons. And then internally restricted is because the board of directors has decided that they're going to park a million dollars as an example 
and not use that money for the programs, which is very different. So one of the things you want to ask is, what are your externally restricted funds? Can you encroach on, on them or can you not encroach on them? And if you're a big enough donor and they tell you we cannot encroach on them, you may want to ask to see some proof of that. Thank you. Um, and, and another question relating to a charity that would have just recently been set up. So a, a, new, a new charity. And the question is, how many years should you expect the charity to establish itself in terms of financials? When should you see those upfront costs start to diminish? Usually a charity that starts up will, for it to survive, it needs to, to be funded upfront so that it can at least go ahead and purchase whatever assets it needs and so forth to run the organ to run to run its programs. So you would want to see a new charity that is doing programs have received sufficient funds from donors to get it going. It may not have a huge cushion, but a donor that will get involved in a new charity, it's because they they feel that this charity can do something interesting. Therefore, should be able to, should help the should try to get a group of charities to help foundations and givers to give it sufficient amount, sufficient amount of funds to be able to run programs and have at least a bit of a cushion. So for me, it's right up front. Or else you're it may run first year and then before you know it, it's going to have to close down. That does happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and we only have a few minutes uh, left, Mike, so I'd, I'd like to actually ask a question as well. Uh, and you didn't mention it in your presentation, and I think, it's, I think it's important, particularly when we're talking about charities and red flags. Um, my tendency would be to suggest that if you have, uh, um, if you notice, financials are numbers on a page, basically, right? If you really want to understand what's going on in a charity or with a grantee, uh, would, would you suggest that a good um, way to get additional information would simply be to have a discussion with the leaders in that particular organization if you have any issues or questions relating to their financials at all? You should always have a discussion. If you're giving money, you should always have, be, be getting in touch with them. To me, it's a given. I, I didn't bring it up because in my mind, it's a given. You should always speak to them. So we have, you know, we have a, we have a, a one foundation that has a donation committee and the donation committee speaks to all the organizations that are asked requesting money. So in all cases, you should be speaking to the, to, to, to the charity. That, that's good advice and that's a good that's a good note I think to end up on Mike because I think you, um, you know again uh, financials are, are numbers and you really want to have conversation with the with the charity itself to find out exactly what's going on in terms of programming staffing and particularly in times of COVID you know uh, um, there is uh, it's a tough time for charities now so I think conversation is probably and that, that uh, the best tool. That. That slide, the last slide we looked at, which said honesty is the best policy. The only way you'll exactly. ever get you'll ever get an answer is you need to speak to them. And then exactly the first slide where we said you need to have a gut feeling. The only way you'll ever have a gut feeling of what you're going to do is if you speak to the organization. Exactly, exactly. So I'd like to also uh, mention to the particip participants before we signed off that. Um, Mike has actually been working with us and Tim in particular, who's on this call on developing a primer on understanding and analyzing financials where we go through in a little bit more detail on the different red flags and that will be available in the next couple of weeks or so. And we also have lots of resources and learning tools that you can use to uh, to um, you know, work with boards if you want to, uh, if you're looking at um, you know, informing boards on, on that particular topic. So that should be coming within the next couple of weeks. It'll be announced in our weekly digest. So please feel free um, to look for it. 
Um, and also, I think we can slip, flip to the last slide also to announce our upcoming webinar next week um, on November 4th on diversity, equity, and inclusion from the ground up, exploring the experiences of equity-focused grantees with the Canadian philanthropic sector. So that's coming up uh, next week. And if you have any burning questions that you feel were not answered today, if you, you know, feel free to uh, contact either uh, myself or my colleagues, Tim or Mervey. We'll be happy to try and get some uh, answers for you to, uh, to any of those questions. So that wraps it up, I think, for today. We're right on time. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Mike, for your time in preparing for this webinar and for your input. Uh, with the primer that we're working on and we're finalizing. So we really appreciate your time and, um, and the very useful information. And all this information, the uh, slides and the recordings, as you know, will be made available after the webinar. So look for those in your inbox. And um, thank you all for joining us and hopefully we'll see you at next week's webinar. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, bye. Goodbye, everyone.